think in a bit of a spontaneous flow. All right. So go for it, whoever and however it goes. I'm just waiting to look at things. I think uh, the whole idea was um, if you can uh, think about uh, the question of air perhaps connected to uh, the pandemic or not in the way it's playing out in whichever way you can capture it, um, whether it is through, you know, I'm sure you know this much more than I can even bring out words to describe it. But anything that you can uh, bring about, uh, bring to the table, which can bring about a discussion on the kind of questions that uh, we've talked about, read about, etc., that would be great. So I think any starting point is good enough. So anyone wants to start with perhaps a city that you're from or any other city you want to talk about? So I, I think we have an example that we can start with. That's okay with everybody. Sure, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? With yep. everyone? So uh, this is an example um, from from Egypt, not exactly from my city, but somewhere uh, I used to work. Okay. Uh, this uh, is a photographer and an artist. Uh, who took uh, who took it on himself to raise awareness about uh, a residential area uh, that is uh, located just beside an industrial area in uh, Alexandria. Mm -hmm. um, it has been a very long debate about whether the this uh, uh, residential area has been there first or the industrial area has been uh, has been there first. The industrial area saying no we are not responsible we were there here first so it's not our problem and the residents are um, complaining about the air pollution and the quality of life as, as you can see from the picture the dust was really uh, a big 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 problem uh, so he took it upon himself to uh, show this problem uh, in a project that he did a couple of years back uh, it ended in 2017 um, and this was really interesting because he went through the social um, um, uh, effect of the industrial area and the air pollution problems uh, really in details about the location, uh, about the, the pictures of the place, the kids playing beside the cement factory, for example, in the streets, um, people were walking and having many diseases, and he interviewed the people there. So he was not a professional or researcher or academic in this sense, but he was uh, conducting uh, a social, social interviews as part of his work. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he went on to see uh, people who were sick from asthma and other, uh, other diseases, from respiratory diseases due to the pollution, right. uh, with the, the notion of helping uh, solve this problem uh, for the people. Um, actually, we were just discussing this in, in my work group um, and we were saying that uh, seeing these examples make, makes, makes the others think that these people uh, are probably the most vulnerable to something like the corona disease because of all the respiratory problems that they are having already uh, from uh, the, the cumulative pollution. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, uh, uh, the government has been taking some measures to, to, to try to solve this problem. Uh, but again, it's, it, we are trying to raise uh, the discussion point. So mm -hmm. this is our example. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't know if anybody wants to come in. That would be great if, uh, if someone has a comment. I mean, I'm just trying to, I, I just want to build up a couple of connections. It's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the absolute basic point, which is that uh, two things I want to say is that there is a kind of misunderstanding that the consciousness of uh, having clean air, etc., is a middle class consciousness. It's uh, and, and and you know people are not aware of what is happening to them, or they are entirely always voiceless. I think that's not. I mean, even art. I mean, the the, the kind of video that we're going to look at, and that's a wonderful resonance you have. You brought out a photography project. 
you know, which is so deeply uh, sociological, so deeply uh, political, uh, which we expect out of art, but you know, where does it lead you to make connection? It makes connections immediately with, let's say, Gertner's essay that you read. Uh, and uh, and this is and if you look at look at what the people are saying, I was just very quickly reading uh, what you were showing on screen. Uh, the words that the people themselves are using, uh, uh, and it, then it becomes very important to understand that uh, is this question of city air, city um, conditions of living, is it always only a middle class consciousness and does the agency come only out of middle class to claim rights? I don't think so. So I have never really bought the idea of bourgeois environmentalism, which is, uh, I think that's, uh, it just doesn't work. I think it's coming out in so many ways. And the pandemic is going to do exactly that. This is, this is the vulnerable population, right? That's an immediate connection. And uh, how are you going to deal with this? So uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's great, lovely. Thank you so much. That's a lovely, lovely example. Anybody else wants to say something about uh, this, any connections? Um, maybe I can add, um, we found this, so I'm also in the working group and we found the, the imagery pretty, uh, yeah, provoking because it um, shows there, this very material layer of air pollution that uh, on a daily basis comes back and layers uh, the, the living the live world that's right. of the people. And I, that's what, how we thought of maybe a, a very particular form of, uh, or a context dependent form of this air pollution. Absolutely. which is uh, rather than connected to some invisible uh, toxic particles, a real uh, 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 a threat that you can see and feel. It's a visible thing. And that's, uh, that's what makes it uh, so much more uh, important to connect. I mean, look at it. At why is it even possible to capture pollution photographically? You know, if you think about it, I mean, I'm sure uh, that our physicists will be able to tell us better that some of these things are not things that you can see, but here is a place uh, where uh, you, can, you can literally see the matter and that, that makes the idea of air uh, connect to what, let's say, and Timothy Choi has gone ahead and done a lot more, is that this is how air substantiates, right? I mean, it becomes something that you can literally touch, see, feel. And that leads you to understanding that social, you know, that world, the way people are talking about their lives. I, as I was saying that, uh, you know, I read a few words on the side when they're saying that, you know, okay, somebody is saying I'm going to be dead soon. The other one is saying that, no, I'm already dead. Uh, I mean, these are things which tell you a lot about uh, what, what is the sense that uh, I think uh, Devin was talking about earlier. How does the individual connect now to the sense of the world that they live in? You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, these are questions that you think, how do they think about their work? How do they think about childhood? How do they think about biographies? You know, all these questions um, come up and it's all connected to this particulate matter, uh, which is out there in the air that they are breathing. So I think, again, it's a lovely and wonderful example. Uh, I'm hoping some of you have something more to say on this. Yep. I'll come in with a quick comment. I won't take up too long, but I posted a link to an exhibition that I went to uh, a couple of days ago at a museum in Stavanger uh, called In the Clouds. And part of it has been moved to a virtual exhibition, so you might want to watch it. And it's, it's looking at, at clouds in science and art. And it's not, it's not strictly air, but it's depictions of a very critical part of air in different landscapes and, uh, and different renderings. I thought that, uh, to me, it played in... Um, very interestingly with, uh, with the essence provocation. It's a, uh, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, air has become something, again, I'm, I'm not someone who's been involved in uh, studying urban uh, pollution or uh, any of all these uh, very related topics. But the fact of this idea of air, which to me is really something that one thought of as the last common thing, right? I mean, it was out there. Nobody could take it away from you. But uh, uh, slowly, and that's the place where all these privileges, inequities, everything is coming in. And not just 
uh, because uh, of either capitalism or it, it's basically the nature of the planet that we are beginning to inhabit. I mean, it's a virus as well, right? I mean, some people want to think that the virus is because of the way with which humans have been treating nature. I'm not very sure. I think, uh, uh, well, I think we're about to enter an era of pandemics. Let's not say this too much. We don't want to, the, uh, you know, young people must not be made to feel worse than we all are. So it's, it's a thing out there, but I think the air idea is going to get more uh, important to think through. Um, but yeah, sure. I don't know what anybody else has to say on this, um, what we just saw. Anyone um, had a comment from their own cities, what's going on right now? Is that a, a question? Um, Esther, I think you said that the government has tried to do something about this. And I was wondering whether this project, whether you know if this project played a role in pushing government to, to act. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if this particular project uh, pushed the government to act or uh, just the sense of responsibility because this uh, example is repeated in a number of informal settlements around industrial areas uh, that came with the industrial revolution in Egypt. Um, but anyway, the government took action, um, whether because of this uh, particular uh, project or because of other project or sense of responsibility, uh, and they they just has put, have put uh, more uh, severe uh, pollution limits and control measures uh, on the industrial areas as one solution. In some cases, it had uh, reached the point that they closed down industrial facilities or relocated them. Uh, to to stay out of the or, or away from the from the residential areas, uh, and in other places they have found that relocating the residential area itself might be a better solution. Uh, but this had economic implications, like the livelihoods of these people, as most of them worked in the industrial area. So moving them away means more uh, transportation money and so on. So it's a complex uh, situation. It's not that easy. Uh, but of course, um, um, having some photographers and people um, showing uh, this kind of, uh, of problem um, were a driver for, for, for the government to move because it, the problem is not just on the ground, it's everywhere. So everybody knows about it. I live in Cairo and this problem is in Alexandria and I know about it as well. That's right, yeah. I mean, with all of this, I, I just want to um, uh, distill people, put together the thoughts of some of this. Uh, what I'm slowly moving towards very, very, uh, I guess, very strongly now more than ever before is that uh, how can we think about the city now as, as a absolutely infinite or is it a very limited object? Because when you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about energy, you're talking about jobs, you're talking about uh, densities of people. Uh, how do we start now thinking about the city? Should we bring back, and even when it comes to understanding the uh, connection with the rural, do we, re do we want to think about this more now, especially when you're thinking about air, that uh, since air in the city seems to have become uh, almost an object, uh, the, the actual um, we say that, okay, it's atmospheric, satellite imagery will tell you some story that there's a big, huge cloud. Uh, Asia is supposed to have a big brown cloud for a while uh, on top of it. Uh, how do we start bringing that down to the actual geography on the ground? Uh, do we need to think about cities differently? Do we need to think about the rural-urban connection more seriously now? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering if any of you are thinking about this in terms of how we, how we address anything. Let's say even the example we talked about, that I can understand it's exactly similar to this year, that we close down industry. They're also closing down jobs, right? And uh, people out to the outside of me. All of
Uh, yes, I mean, I think they're breaking up a little bit at our end. Can give uh, yes, I mean, a couple of minutes to uh, back on track, and perhaps uh, there are other examples in the meantime. Somebody wants to share. Are you back? Ah, great. Um, group four has an example that's quite different. Um, should we? Yeah, uh, I'll share my screen, so. Uh. So we, we've got, I'll give just a quick introduction first. We've got a video from South Africa, from Mpumalanga, which is a, so it's not a city per se, it's a region, uh, it's a province in South Africa. And it's one which is very rich in coal reserves. It produces about 80% of the country's coal. And it's also home to South Africa's big um, coal power stations, three of which are the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. These are mainly owned by ESCOM which is the parastatal, which means that it's at least 50% of it is owned by the state. And ESCOM has the monopoly on South African uh, electricity production. Um, these power stations and the coal mines provide employment for people in the area, most of whom um, were excluded from proper education during the years of apartheid, which means that they also have limited opportunities for other employment. And it's also an area where the unions are very strong in the mining, uh, mining coal and mining sector in South Africa. But at the same time, it creates these power stations and the coal mining uh, produce a lot of health problems for the locals who are also employed, to some extent employed in this industry. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. Then we're not going to watch the whole thing. We're just going to watch um, three and a half minutes. Okay, can everybody see my screen properly? Uh, yeah. Me? Yeah, okay. Can't hear the sound. You might need to share again and take okay. a box that says optimized for video. Share sound. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the first time I share. So, uh, stop sharing. Um, hmm. Mpumalanga, the place of the rising sun a region so beautiful that even God has his own window. But below the beautiful sunshine lies a dirty truth. It is also home to some of the most polluted air in the world. Last year, environmental agency Greenpeace announced that the high fault of Mpumalanga has the world's highest level of nitrogen dioxide in the air, based on analysis of satellite data. The area is the nation's coal heartland, home to over 100 coal mines. EWN traveled to Middleburg to meet the people who live under this cloud of dust. The pollution every day in the morning, afternoon, the pollution is getting worse. Every time I get sick, I'm drinking the pills every in the morning, and my asthma can start any time. Maybe sometimes the, the, the pill doesn't work. Uh, I must have a, there is a oxygen. So I must go to the doctor, which is I don't have money to go to the doctor. Mother of five, Sophia Pakla, is a manager at a local community work program. Her husband, Foy Bosiki, used to work in a coal mine, but has been unemployed for two years. This family of seven survives on just 2,500 rand a month. Uh, my, my kids, are not breathing well and especially they have a uh, the skin problem they're just crashing themselves getting rashes so every time we must go to the clinic and my my old kid is the is the girl she has a uh, affected with the eyes hakla is just one of many residents we met that experiences health issues 
because of the pollution from the mines and power plants. The bustling town of Middleburg is a haven of good community service and business opportunities for many residents who also live in surrounding areas and is rated as one of the best places to live in Pumalanga with nearly 10 years of clean audits. Ibrahim Patel has lived in this town most of his life. As former president of the Middleburg Chamber of Commerce, he commissioned a study into finding out how many coal mines and power plants were in the area. Uh, green squares, these are all the mines. These are all the 150 odd mines in this region. So 99% of mining activity here is coal. Patel says he's noticed that the implementation of environmental regulations is inconsistent that he says hurts both honest business people who get bogged down with red tape and allows dishonest entrepreneurs to get away with flouting regulations. You have this type of lopsided application where policy documents uh, are five star, but the actual impl uh, implementation, it depends very much on the mood and the type of person who is the uh, uh, employee in the civil service who is going to implement those policies. So you have overcompliance, which is killing and stifling uh, ordinary, honest human beings that want to conduct business in this environment. And you have, on the other hand, people getting away with absolute murder. Tokoloko Township. Um, so yeah, after the three minutes, we thought it, uh, it's a good idea to provoke a discussion by sort of reflecting back on those socio-political structures that were mentioned and the appetite uh, issues that actually led to those and were exposed to health issues in, in the video and that these are more or less common in different situations where uh, people face climate adversaries and um, there is some form of climate injustice and those issues socio-political structures can be exposed in different contexts as uh, some form of uh, inequalities in uh, being exposed to specific weather conditions and climate issues. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. So if I was just to, uh, you know, kind of um, force an exercise on everyone uh, who's just seen both the uh, little clips, uh, what I mean, and I'm really trying to think hard about it. I don't have an answer, but I'm just asking the question: uh, What would you list as the uh, things which are common, you know, in a way, uh, in both? I mean, you know, we have the obvious ones, which is uh, pollution, and we have possibly similarity in the type of pollution as well. Uh, I can't say that industrial uh, toxic. Uh, matter is similar to mining toxic matter but uh, I'm sure there'll be a difference but uh, what would you think comes to your mind very quickly uh, when we are looking at these two sorts of clips um, what what hits you the most You know, just top of head, sometimes uh, instinct is better than... Um... I, I don't want to talk too much, but the one first thing that comes to mind for me is the link to employment. So the fact that people are who are often impacted in their private lives by living in the area also mm -hmm. have employment. From my understanding, that was the case in the other one as well. Mm -hmm. They work in the industries that create it. So there's this very difficult... Um, negotiation between needing Absolutely. it and it's yeah. impacting you that's 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 a, a it's a great point because um, it kind of uh, adds up if you and it's making me think what you just said that it kind of adds up to this problem doesn't it that um, the the uh, the latter one the one that we saw right now uh, it's as you said it's about a region it's not necessarily about a city per se but it would certainly affect these little townships the other is about a more urban uh, kind of environment but the point is uh, how do we start and this is where human geography comes in full scale is that uh, how do we connect this question of pollution people and the limits of space, you know, the, the, the question is that people will have to live 
particularly in this era, they have to live close to where they work. It's the nature of the work itself. You know, it's not something, as we were talking before we started this whole thing, is that ours is one of the few professions that can continue this kind of work. But it is the nature of profession itself that leads you to certain kinds of ways of living, literally to the kind of air that you have to breathe. You know, so it's, it's so much now connected to the nature of work. You know, that, that, that makes you want to think about uh, how do we start understanding then uh, our work in the urban? How do we start thinking about pollution? Uh, shouldn't it be immediately a question of housing? You know, it's, it's, it's really that. I mean, I'm, I'm beginning to worry about that, for, for, uh, uh, especially in the urban environment. We know this a lot, but uh, housing and transport now becomes very crucial. To the pollution question, uh, as, as we just heard from the earlier example from Alexandria, is that let's say you close the industry, what are these people going to do? Or let's say you tell them that, okay, move them to outside the city or whatever it is. Sometimes these people simply cannot move. And if you're already health vulnerable, meaning to say not everybody has the strength to take on a, a, you know, a 20 mile ride to work and back. So how do you start thinking? And so all I'm trying to say is that like we obviously none of us are going to find a solution one day. But what I want you to think about is what are the issues that are getting connected? You know, just by two little video clips, uh, what are the issues that have suddenly come right up front? You know, pollution is suddenly connected very deeply to the question of housing and labor. You know, how are you going to make people suddenly change everything they work and they say, okay, from tomorrow, you're no longer going into the mine because you're so unhealthy and you're not going to be able to work in a mine if you want to live. So let's make you do something else. Is that possible? Is that easy? So, you know, um, in a way, uh, I think what I'm saying is that let's pay attention to what things are connecting up just because of these two videos, these excellent things that we just saw you know, and the way they're connecting to each other. I think we're coming up for a break. Shall we come back and uh, talk about some more of this? <laughs> 